Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Gary Garrido Snyder, Executive Director of Grounds for Sculpture, a 42-acre public arts center situated on the former New Jersey State Fairgrounds. Gary has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Gary, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Mark. So Grounds for Sculpture is, a, is such an interesting place. Could you describe the genesis of the organization and also the, the art that you present? Sure, sure. Grounds for Sculpture has been open to the public for around 20 years. Uh, as you said, it's situated on the former New Jersey State Fairgrounds. And it's evolved over the years, adding acreage as it became available. It is um, referred to as a magical place. It's quite inventively, creatively, and densely landscaped. So the 42 acres are quite manicured. Uh, and they create small little rooms for around 200 to 250 sculptures. So it creates meandering paths that sort of encourage people to have a sense of discovery as they explore the park. And these are rooms in the sense of not rooms, but in sense sure. of, of environment. So the, the sculpture actually fits within the landscape in a, in a particularly intentional way. Yeah, so the artist and the ar architect and the landscape architect over the years have worked very closely together to kind of create these outdoor rooms or outdoor environments in which the landscape uh, supports and complements and is in sort of dialogue or conversation with the sculptures. Talk about your mission. Sure. Um, Grounds for Sculpture was founded to exhibit contemporary art, contemporary sculpture, and to make it accessible to the broadest public as possible. Um, having work in an outdoor setting uh, kind of puts people at ease. Um, it is uh, sort of an unassuming kind of environment to uh, approach artwork. It's a little different than uh, the more hallowed halls of, of a museum proper. Uh, and as such, we've over the years uh, really attracted a very sort of populist, broad-based audience. And that's really guided you know, our philosophy and approach as we move forward. Talk about how your organization functions, the staff that you have, the different competencies that you need to bring in to maintain this facility. Yeah, it might be helpful to, to actually go back to the sort of the founding of the organization, because uh, Grounds for Sculpture actually grew out of something called the Johnson Atelier. We were founded by Sewer Johnson, who's a Johnson & Johnson heir, philanthropist, and a sculptor. And he had founded the Johnson Atelier, which is a foundry and production facility and mm -hmm. school. Um, to teach the craft of, of casting and modeling, molding, patina. And so that base of sort of technical skill and ability, we really grow out of that. Um, the building that they had happened to be next to the former uh, vacant state fairgrounds. And as the school grew and more and more artists were coming in to have their work produced there, they needed a place to put them. And so when the work, when the land became available for sale, it was purchased and Slowly but surely, um, the works went from being just placed out there in storage to thinking, well, wouldn't this look better with? And being, so the, presented, present, being presented instead of just stored. Exactly. And so I would say that the artists were very much involved from the very beginning in terms of what would be the most optimal way for their sculptures to be displayed outdoors. And there was some criticism about a, an individual doing this and, and presenting mm -hmm. um, in certain respects uh, his passion, his um, interests. Yes. Um, so talk about how that image of Grounds for Sculpture has evolved and the relationship with the community has evolved over time. Sure. Um, you know, I think w w it grows out of a very passionate founder. And so what we're in right now is is, is in a transition, uh, moving from a founder-led to a self-sustaining self -sustaining organization. Uh, and so there's, that's always a delicate balance. And know? this is where you know whether the founder's vision has legs. I mean, yes. w whether it's for an art museum or for an, an organization like Apple, mm -hmm. where the, the founder has a vision that may or may not take off, it ends up being proved by how much it is embraced by the community. So I would say that the founder's vision is, is fully embraced by, by our regional community. We had over 230,000 visitors last year. Very um, respectable. Yes. Very respectable. And a, and a growth from the previous year of 150,000. So quite a big, um, a lot of amount of growth in the past year. Uh, much of that is, is attributed to a retrospective of the founder's work, Seward Johnson. So I think that's a testament to the public's, uh, sort of the public appeal of, of his work and the kind of whimsical and very sort of open, accessible um, space that was created at Grounds for Sculpture. Um, our challenge going forward is how do you interpret those values, those core values of the founder, and interpret them as you go forward. And so one of the interesting challenges that I came in, I began as the executive director back in May of last year. And uh, this is a process that's been ongoing for probably about four or five years, mm -hmm. uh, and a significant transfer from the founder, 
whose family foundation still owned the collection, the land, and the buildings. And Grounds for Sculpture was really the operator of the space. Right. Um, and as of January 1, uh, probably a valued around $50 million transfer occurred, transferring all of those assets to the nonprofit Grounds for Sculpture. And so what we've, the exercise that we've been going through over the past year is how do you create uh, sort of agreements with, with the founder that are related to this donation that honor some of those core values but allow the elasticity for an organization to evolve? The flexibility. Yeah. And what may work now, how does that translate 10 years from now? How does that translate 50 years from now? And the decisions we're making as an organization are going to affect the sort of ability for the organization to adapt. So it's, it's a, something we're very much thinking about. So at this point, you're actually mm -hmm. not only establishing the future, you're honoring the past, but you're, you're also establishing the future. And you're trying to, with your board, determine where the delicate balance is mm -hmm between the past and the future. So you you are in a, at a real inflection point. Yes. What other kinds of changes are you considering? Does this also have an impact on how you operate, your funding, your, your staffing, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth? Yeah, so I think one of the other implications of the transition is that we will be sort of weaned off of a significant source of funding from the Family Foundation. So it's uh, brought into light that we didn't have a very diversified broad base of contributed support. We actually have close to 60% of our, our revenue comes from earned revenue. So we're, we're clearly looking to try to maximize the, the, the earned revenue, uh, but I think the, the largest area of opportunity and growth for, for us will be in contributed income. And so we have a very aggressive uh, development uh, strategy uh, that's linked from starting with marketing and first contact through the guest experience, through various ways that we deepen the engagement, through uh, educational programs and, and other ways that we try to have more repeat visitors, moving people on to membership and, and hopefully um, into feeling that they're co-owners of the space. Talk about how your education programming and your plans for education programming are, are evolving in response to these sure. uh, challenges. Yeah, no, I think the education program and the way in which we engage the public is going to be key to that, uh, extending that experience. And we're using business. education also as a designation that is not just about children. We're talking about public programming of various sure. so sorts. It is the experience of the art. It is understanding of the techniques. We have, of course, mm -hmm. this history that links to the techniques of producing art, uh, the, the, uh, the creation of the art, the physical creation mm -hmm. of the art, all the way through the intent of the artist, the philosophy that is embodied or the ideas that are embodied in particular works. Mm -hmm. And then you also have these grounds that, that are also not only a place for education, but mm -hmm. also how, you, how do you cite art, all these different aspects that can be revealed through, through that type of programming. Yeah, no, I think there's tremendous opportunity for us to grow in, in that arena. And when I do think of education, I think of lifelong learning. So it really cuts across different kinds of experience. And it does have a place for more scholarly and academic learning, but it also is experiential. Um, you know, a great program that we currently have, uh, we have the, uh, a very large campus and there's a number of sister organizations that are on the campus, and uh, including the International Sculpture Center. So mm -hmm. that we're partnering with them next month on a project with the artist Oliver Herring who creates these programs called TAST, which are sort of interactive uh, participatory art experiences. We also have 24 artist studios on the property. And tomorrow um, we have open studios and the artists will all be doing demonstrations related to their particular craft or technique. Um, we work very closely with them. They provide a lot of the sort of hands-on art uh, courses and educational experiences, uh, including a, a very sort of impressive day. It's called the Iron, Iron Pour. Uh, and so we have uh, 100 visitors are able to create a very simple molds um, mm. out of styrofoam. They get to carve them out. Oh, that's uh, So they actually get to make the pro go through the process of making a mold. Uh, and they come back that la later that afternoon, and we actually pour molten iron into those molds. By the end of the day, they go home with a, an iron tile of their design. Um, this year it expanded to a four-week workshop, six hours a day. Uh, where a group of maybe say 20 individuals made much more complex three-dimensional molds. So I, I think there's great potential and great interest for both uh, novice and also sort of art artists as well um, to be taking courses here and having that kind of physical, kind of tactile kind of approach. And let's make no mistake, these kinds of programs have so many different purposes. Yes, they are about the physical act of creation. Mm -hmm. They are also about design. Mm -hmm. They're also about collaboration. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. How do you mm -hmm. collaborate with others and, and each bring in your own skills and sensibilities together? They also have a, a business impact in terms of binding somebody mm -hmm. through their own experience to the institution. This is where I did this. And come and bring, come here and see where I did this because you could see this too. So you've got an audience that's expansion yes. piece. Yeah, I think that, that sort of engagement of the community and is, is key to that. There's an earned revenue side to the workshops There's an earned as well. revenue side. Um, I think the thing that we haven't yet figured out, and I'm looking forward um, to be doing this over the next six months, is to kind of figure out what is, what is our brand promise in terms of those kinds of courses. What is unique about Grounds for Sculpture uh, in that regard? How does your board evolve in response to these new challenges that you have with this founder transition mm -hmm. um, and, and this need to create new revenue streams and diversify mm -hmm. the revenue streams, also engage diverse audiences? Mm -hmm. how, does, how does that affect your, your board composition and um, in particular um, uh, how your board can continue to assist you in, sure. in pursuing that, uh, those types of changes? So the, the board is, it's an amazing board and they're incredibly generous and in both with resources and time and, and their network. Um, it's also a very young board. Uh, so our development efforts for a 20 year old organization, our fundraising and development department only began four years ago. Um, so the board as being a real robust uh, governance board also begins at that period of time. Um, in 2010, there were four board members. Mm -hmm. We now are at 14. And so it's been a very sort of measured and steady growth of adding anywhere from two to four board members per year right. um, and being very strategic about the kinds of skills um, and, and sort of perspectives uh, that, that they bring and, uh, to, the, to the table. And do you have various standards for board participation in, uh, embedded in your uh, bylaws, or are those right now quite soft and that's going to be evolved over the next yeah, time? Yeah, we're, we're re-examining the bylaws. Uh, that's part of the process this year. And we're also looking at what does the committee structure look like, what's the most, uh, what is required of a committee structure, and mm -hmm. what's maybe more ad hoc or task force oriented, uh, and trying to um, help our staff also learn to work with the board, because they had been used to not having to work with a, uh, a fully functional uh, nonprofit board that's taking their role very serious. Um, and so part of my job is also bridging that and trying to find opportunities for the staff board um, sort of collaboration and sort of co-leading initiatives. It's an interesting uh, idea. On the one hand, you want to set the appropriate roles mm -hmm. for uh, oversight, accountability. Mm -hmm. Of course, the board is the fiduciary of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the organization. Um, you also want to provide uh, freedom, respect that is, that is bi-directional. You want to engage. So this very sensitive uh, area mm -hmm. of, of getting it right, you're, you have the opportunity to, instead of coming in and finding a fait accompli which yes. works in certain respects and doesn't work, you have the luxury mm -hmm. with your board to thoughtfully consider how those how that balance is struck and how those rules work. Yeah, no, it's, it's an incredibly kind of exciting opportunity to, it's part of what attracted me to the position, is this opportunity to build these structures and to kind of professionalize and bring a level of professionalization to this organization uh, that has so much potential and so many great things going for it, such great momentum in different areas. Um, and there's this next stage. And so it's, it's been quite exciting. I, I think a great example of a way in which this kind of synergy has, has been occurring is in our marketing area. And we have two uh, board members who um, bring uh, expertise in marketing, one who worked um, in the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry, so incredible uh, sense of uh, understanding market and, and marketing uh, professional skills. But then another whose expertise is in diversity marketing, particularly within the Latino and, um, and uh, African-American community. And so they are co-chairs of our marketing committee and been working very closely with our marketing chair to develop a strategic marketing plan. So it, uh, rather than um, redoing a full strategic plan, what we've been doing are deep dives into different departments. So uh, this past year, we, we do dove down into marketing and developed a, a robust strategic plan. And part of our strategy is that that strategic plan is not just our marketing director's plan, that it's the institution's plan. And that's you know been one of the things that we've had to kind of work around. So there are four target audiences. Uh, uh, sort of a early retiree baby, baby boomer, which really is to say that is our current audience and it's um, acknowledging that it, we are gonna still prioritize and, and 
work to deepen our relationship with that audience. Another is the corporate sector, where we see great opportunity for grounds for sculpture uh, and growing involvement within the Princeton corridor. It's a huge number of corporations and businesses, and we see their involvement in a number of ways. They see a lot of value in our organization. Uh, we have a lot of rental facilities. We have a uh, upscale restaurant, which is used for client cultivation and other kinds of events. There's great uh, corporate volunteer give back opportunities and working in the garden. So we see a lot of synergy with the business community and a lot of opportunity to grow that. And, and obviously for uh, sponsorship, uh, either through their philanthropic kind of goals or uh, through um, corporate marketing kind of sponsorship. Uh, young professionals, we're very mindful that we need to kind of feed in to, uh, we may have lost not being out in the market right. to attract donors and not having a development department for the first 16 years of organization, we may have missed the boat on some of the funders. And we may be able to get them in, but we're also mindful that we don't want to do that again. And right. so we're really trying to, um, the 30, 40 year old business leaders, leaders in the community, we're trying to, to have them come serve on our board and, um, and get them involved. Uh, and the last is I have a strong commitment to sort of diversifying and expanding audience for cultural institutions. I think it, it's a passion that I've brought from other organizations that I've worked with. I worked at Parsons School of Design and, and led a scholarship program at the Montclair Art Museum. I led their diversity initiative and relations with the, the black community in the town and the region. So it's, it's an area that I bring that I think mirrors the founder's vision at Grounds for Sculpture of creating a place that's accessible, makes art accessible to all. And in terms of, of the other work that you're doing to maintain the grounds and, and advance the grounds? We've outsourced a lot of the maintenance of the grounds, mm -hmm. but we haven't thought of it in a programmatic way. Uh, and so we hired a, a great individual who is working with our development department to find fundraising opportunities to support the care of the grounds. Care of the grounds is a million and a half dollars a year alone. Um, so it's, it's a high priority for us. Right. There's great opportunity. I would say maybe a third of our audience comes to us because of the garden setting. And while we identif self-identify as an arts institution, they see us as a garden. And so I think there's some great educational and um, sort of uh, visibility kind of opportunities. And so he's hit the ground running in those areas. And the garden itself is a living, growing sculpture. It mm -hmm. is something that changes with the season. It is, a, um, it is both a context, but an art in, it, in itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and one of the challenges that we have is that the grounds are fairly full and, and well-developed. Um, so um, in, in some ways, there isn't a lot of resources that we need to uh, apply to that. So we're, we have a, quite a, a sort of lovely space already. Um, but when you think about the ability to evolve as an organization right. and to continue to engage artists, and a big part of our history has been working with living artists and providing opportunities for them to create new work. When the 42 acres are full, where does that occur? And so we do have six fairly large galleries um, on the former state fairgrounds, two of the buildings were retrofitted uh, into large gallery spaces, and there's an adjacent industrial building that we've just finished retrofitting. And so we've had a number of really interesting exhibitions this year. Uh, we had a retrospective of the architect and designer Michael Graves that opened back in October. It was really quite touching and, and, and wonderful to be able to honor Michael, who turned 80 earlier in the year. He had, um, we had a wonderful timeline that showed his career from the early 50s as a student to work that his firm and he were continuing to work on. Um, Michael actually unfortunately passed away just a few weeks ago. Uh, we've been able to extend the exhibition. We've been working very closely with his firm on that. Um, but it reminds me also the important role that museums have, not just to our public, but the relationships that we have right. with artists. And to be able to have provided that moment where he was able to experience, see his life's work, have his former clients, his former employees come to the opening and, and, and to be with him, it was really quite, Quite special and it's one of the areas I think is sometimes underrecognized the kind of role that arts institutions have in nurturing and supporting artists in those ways um, and moving forward we have an exhibition that opens this spring of Washington DC based artist Jay Co the Korean American artist who works largely with paper and we've enabled we're doing a solo exhibition of her paperwork and we've commissioned the largest work that she's made to date it's a 80 foot long piece maybe 80 feet by 16 feet high made out of uh, rolls of paper that are kind of unfurrowed um, and then sculpted into these sort of magical cloud-like paint drip kind of forms, quite lyrical, um, referencing areas of nature. Obviously, it references uh, Japanese and Chinese brush painting. It's so wonderful that you're providing commissions as well for the creation of new works that can be presented 
at Grounds for Sculpture. Yeah, no, it, it's a, it was a fabulous opportunity for the public and for our staff. She was in residence for a full four or five weeks, so people got to see this work unfold. It was really quite a, a special opportunity for us. It's, it, it's an amazing place, and I'm so happy that you were able to come here and share your experience. Gary Guido Schneider, thank you so much for sharing your work at Grounds for Sculpture, and thank you so much for your insight. Thank you, Mark. Thanks.